Let's look at an example of normal stress occurring in a structure. Here's a picture of the Utah Olympic Oval. It was built uh, for use in the 2002 Olympic Winter Games that were held in Salt Lake City. This is a very uh, interesting structure. Uh, you can see that the roof is supported by these cables that are then uh, attached, that run over a tower and attached to the ground. And this is to allow a large open space inside uh, so that uh, the spectators will have uh, unobstructed views of the sporting events. Now during construction, uh, there was a, a mishap. Uh, you can see this is the structure uh, being constructed piece by piece. And here, this tower, you see laying on the ground, uh, not long before this photo was taken, was standing upright, like these other towers. And the section of the roof it was holding is now laying on the ground. Let's look at what's going on. Okay, This roof has a load. It's heavy. It needs to be resisted. And the cables that are shown here are resisting that load. We can follow the load path up the cable, up and over the tower, and down to an anchor. And that anchor is then attached with some foundation to the ground. So it's fascinating to think that out here at this anchor, uh, we are holding several feet away from the structure, we are holding the weight of the roof. Now what happened to this anchor that caused this accident? Well, you can see here's a, uh, a picture of that anchor on the outside of the structure. Here's the load, uh, th which is the weight of the roof, and here is the, uh, the foundation supporting that load. And what happened was this anchor fractured. And you can see that fracture in the surface. And this surface right here, just prior to the accident, was resisting a force in this direction that was from the weight of the roof. And that induced a normal stress over this cross-section. But the stress in the cross-section exceeded the material strength, and it failed. Now, there are really only two types of stress. Previously, we discussed normal stress. Now let's talk about the other type, shear stress. In this picture, the shank of the bolt has been subjected to a shear force, uh, which has resulted in the formation of shear stress within the bolt shank. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Here's a picture of that same structure prior to failure. Okay. Let's imagine the, the bolt shank that goes through this structure, and let's draw a free body dry diagram of the bolt shank. It's going to look something like this. Okay. And it has forces, one force uh, pointing upward, and another one balancing that pointing down. Now what I want to do is take a theoretical cut right here through the bolt shank. And now, on that cut surface, I will have three internal resultant loads, uh, a, sh a normal force, a shear force, and a moment. Now, we know that the normal force is going to be zero. The shear force, I will add, and label it with a V, and uh, if we assume that these are pretty thin plates, which they are, then that moment uh, will be pretty small across that surface. So we're just going to neglect that, it, that there is a moment there. And, and this is what we call simple or direct shear. Now I want to look a little mo more closely at uh, this uh, cut section. Okay, so here it is. If we balance our forces in the y direction, we'll find that uh, our shear force is equal to the applied load P. Okay? But we know that that shear force on that cross section isn't really acting just along a, a, a vertical line as it's drawn here, but that shear force is really going to be spread across this cross sectional area. Okay? So we can better represent that with the picture on the right, where that shear force is really spread over the cross sectional area. The whole cross section is contributing. Uh, in in resisting or in uh, in transferring this 
load P. Okay? And we will call that uh, distribution of force over the area, of a shear force over an area, uh, tau. That is our shear stress. We'll use lowercase Greek letter tau, and we're going to call it tau average because it's average, taking that shear force and averaging it over the whole surface. And we can write a simple equation for shear stress. It's equal to V over A, where V is the internal, internal shear force and A is the cross-sectional area. What are the units? Well, the units are the same as they were for normal stress, which is, in U.S. customary units, we typically use uh, pounds per inch squared or kips per inch squared. Another way to write these, of course, is PSI or KSI, kips per square inch. Okay. In international units, the typical uh, unit that we'll be using in this course is the Pascal, which is a Newton per meter squared. And typically we'll be seeing units of mega pascals. That's a million pascals to represent stress. So where does we see shear stress in the real world? Well, it's all around us. Here you can see on this structural pin, uh, we're supporting some structure above, and that load is going to be transferred from this, this structural element through the pin to the support. Okay? So that pin will be experiencing a shear stress. Here in this figure on the right, we show what we call a shear pin. That shear pin connects the sprocket to the shear pin hub, which is connected to uh, the driving shaft. And the purpose of the shear pin is to keep the sprocket connected to the, sh to the shaft. But should the sprocket become jammed, to prevent damage to the shaft and the driving motor, the shear pin will fail so that the shaft can continue to spin without damaging the motor. One more topic I'd like to discuss, and then we're through. It's this idea of double shear and single shear. Now this picture on the right that we looked at before is a condition of single shear. There's only one surface on this bolt that is experiencing direct shear. Now, uh, in this picture on the left, where we have a clevis with a pin, there's actually going to be two shear surfaces. We'll call that double shear. Let's look at it a little more closely. Here is the object I was referring to as a clevis. The clevis connects these two rods, and it's a pin. A pin is used to transfer the load. Okay? Now, if we were to draw a free body diagram, of that pin it would look something like this. We have our a single load, P0, on the right. And as shown here in this picture, that load is being split into two legs. Okay? And that's shown here on the free body diagram. To balance the load, uh, both of these forces have to be P0 over 2. Now this pin is in static equilibrium. Now we can look at what the shear stress is inside this pin by considering this surface. The shear stress on that surface, or the average shear stress, is equal to the internal shear force divided by the area. And we can write that as the internal shear force on this, on this cross section is half of the total load, P0 over 2. So we could write that P0 over 2 divided by the cross sectional area of the pin. Now another way to look at this is to say uh, this load that's being applied is being resisted by two cross sections. One here and one here. So another way we could write the equation for average shear stress is to take the load P0 and divide it by two areas for the pin. Either case, both of these ways of looking at it give the same result. And that's all.